Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for the third in our series of uh, on PR systems. And again, I'm Anita Nickerson. I'm Fair Vote Canada's Action Coordinator. And our guest for this series on PR systems is Byron Weber Becker. Byron is a lecturer at University of Waterloo in computer science, and he's done extensive research uh, modeling different PR systems for Canada, how they can be designed, how they perform compared to first past the post and other PR systems. And in this webinar, we're going to be zooming in on one particular system, uh, which we have called Rural Urban Proportional. Uh, now, just to give you the heads up, that name is sort of a in, little bit of an internal name, and it may evolve. But the idea with RUPR is that proportional representation can be designed a little bit differently for the rural and the urban areas. Now, this system that Byron helped us design was one of the two systems that was recommended by the federal NDP in Greens um, in their supplementary, supplementary report to the ERRE, the Federal Electoral Reform Commission. And there's, with the BC referendum coming up, there's a fair bit of interest in whether this might be on the ballot in BC. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Byron. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll admit right up front, I took a liberty without talking with Anita, and I expanded the scope of this presentation. So uh, we're going to talk about rural urban and also a little bit about local proportional representation as well. So um, let's just check here if everyone can see my screen, uh, a slide that says make every vote count made, uh, with made for Canada systems. Yeah, uh, people are seeing it. Okay, hold on. Wolf says okay. no, no, no audio. Uh, is that still the case? Uh, everybody no. else can see in here, right? Seen lots of good to goes. Okay, well, let's proceed then. Um, so, making every vote count with Made for Canada systems. By Made for Canada systems, we mean systems that take into account specifically some of the, the peculiarities of Canada. So, the outline for today is we're going to do a fast review of the stuff that we looked at in the previous two parts of this webinar. Um, first of all, we'll look at appropriate electoral reform principles, which systems other countries are using. And for those of you that have been here for all three uh, webinars, I know that's review and we'll go really fast over that. Then we'll uh, pick out the key points of multi-member systems and mixed member systems from the previous two webinars. And I'm doing that particularly because they are necessary groundwork for rural urban and uh, need at least a reminder to a refresher uh, before we dive into rural urban. So we'll take a brief look at what the distinctive Canadian challenges are and then look at rural urban, local PR, and then pause for questions and responses. So once again, this is uh, the mandate that the Electoral Reform Committee was given by the Liberal government when they started their hearings. It's a big wall of text. It boils down this way. Effectiveness and legitimacy is all about fairness. Engagement is about people being engaged with the political process if they want to, and hopefully uh, transforming the political process so that they want to be engaged. Accessibility and inclusiveness is that we shouldn't put up any unnecessary barriers to people engaging. Integrity really isn't an issue with any of these systems that we're uh, looking at. Um, and local representation is, uh, has been a consistent um, uh, value in Canada uh, that needs to be represented in the electoral system. And the last one, uh, good governance, wasn't in the mandate given to the committee, but fair vote thinks that it uh, is really important. When we look at those and consider our winner-take-all systems, such as first past the post, they just don't score very well. And uh, you've seen this chart before in the other webinars and know our feelings that proportional systems score extremely well on all of these uh, criteria. Who's using different systems? Well, first past the post is only used by four countries out of the top 50 or so on the UN Human Development Index. 
and the ones in yellow there, uh, many more countries use some sort of proportional system. Proportion, uh, electoral systems, of course, fall into families, winner-take-all systems and proportional systems. We're going to look first at just do a quick review of the multi-member systems, then a quick review of mixed member, and then we'll look at those made in Canada or made for Canada systems. So multi-member systems in review. They combine several ridings into one riding, but elect the same total number of MPs. Uh, if we took an example, Waterloo Region, where Anita and I live, uh, there's sort of five ridings that make up this region that are shown there on the left. Those might be combined in a multi-member system into the one district on the right uh, that covers the same area. In the 2015 election, those five ridings elected four liberals and one conservative. But if we pooled our resources and all voted together for five people, well, then we might come up with different results and hopefully they would be much more proportional. In the 2015 federal election with four liberals and one conservative in this area, the liberals got way more votes than they deserved. 80% uh, of the MPs, sorry, 80% of the MPs, only 46% of the votes, way more seats than they deserved. If things were fair, this is how it would turn out. In this region, we'd have two conservatives, two liberals, and one NDP. That would be proportional, as close to proportional to the votes cast as we could make it with five MPs. And as we talked, there are a number of different ways to elect those MPs, closed list, an open list, single transferable vote, uh, and so on, uh, to arrive at, at this end result. I want to just recap a little, about, a little bit about STV, the single transferable vote in particular, because that's the one we rely on later on in today's presentation. Recall that there's a quota. That's the number of votes that guarantees a win. Okay? That's based on the number of votes and the number of seats that you have to fill. Uh, in particular, you divide the number of votes by the seats plus one and add one. That's the number of votes that a person needs in order to guarantee that they win. Um, and when a candidate receives more than that quota of votes, then that excess is fairly transferred to the next ranked candidate on each voter's ballot. So for example, suppose the quota is 30,000 votes, but Carrie gets 40,000 votes. Then she really only needs three-fourths of each vote in order to meet quota, in order to win the seat. And so one-fourth of each vote can be transferred to the next ranked candidate on each of those ballots. So the way single transferable vote works then, once you've got the quota, is you repeatedly ask the question, has a candidate reached quota? If so, then declare that person elected. They have enough votes and fairly transfer any excess votes that they might have. If no one's reached quota, then find the candidate with the fewest votes. Declare that person to be eliminated. They can't win. Transfer their votes to the next remaining candidate on each ballot. And you keep doing that over and over and over again until there are as many candidates left as there are seats in the, in the district. And that gets to, you know, that in this case would elect five people uh, and with this result of two conservatives, two liberals, and an MDP uh, for this particular, which is proportional to the votes cast in the 2015 election. So that's uh, multi-member with single transferable vote. Let's now do a really quick review of mixed member. That was the subject of our second webinar. In mixed member, the core principle is that you have single member ridings in a multi-member region. Byron? Yes. I forgot to mention one important thing in the introduction. For those yes. that haven't ever been on a webinar with us before, you mm -hmm. should have a question box. And as Byron is going through his presentation, if you have questions that you want answered, um, type them into the question box and we'll be answering questions at the end of his presentation. That's it. Thanks, Anita. And actually, I'm going to uh, uh, stop at the end of rural urban for questions specifically about rural urban, and then we'll dive into local proportional, local PR, and we'll stop for more questions at the end of local. So mixed member proportional. Um, the idea is to have single member ridings in a multi-member region, and to illustrate that, we'll 
uh, look at southern Ontario. So here's uh, southwestern Ontario. Anita and I live in that lower center area uh, with that a uh, little bit above that green point that's sticking out down below. Um, and those are some of the Great Lakes and Georgian Bay that you see uh, up and, and to the left and up and to the right. Um, so that's the area that we're starting with for this example. In the 2015 election, this group of ridings of 15 ridings elected five liberals and 10 conservatives. If you compare that with a vote, this time the conservatives got many more MPs, many more seats than they deserved at the cost, of course, of the liberals and the NDP and the green. Um, in this particular, yeah, so they got uh, two thirds of the seats when they only deserved 40%. So the way mixed member proportional deals with that is they take that same area and instead of having 15 ridings, they carve it up into 10 ridings in this example. Uh, that leaves five extra MPs to represent the region at large. And those regional MPs are chosen to ensure proportionality. So here's my attempt at playing uh, the Boundaries Commission role. I took those 15 ridings and uh, combined every two ridings into sorry, every three writings into two, to come up with 10 writings. So the original writings are on the left, the new boundaries, complements of me, are on the right. Uh, we could guess that those 10 writings would elect four liberal MPs and six conservative MPs. But recall now that we have five MPs left over for making the writings larger. And so we've got five extra MPs. The question is, how do we allocate them? To be fair, would like to have six Liberal MPs, six Conservative MPs, two NDP, and one Green. That would be as close to proportional as we can get for the 2015 federal election. So the Conservatives already have six MPs from those local ridings. So they don't get any of those five top-up MPs. The Liberals got four local MPs, the ones down in the lower right of that map, and so they deserve two of the extra MPs, those top-up MPs. The NDP did not get any local MPs, and so they, but they deserve two, so they get two of the uh, top-up MPs, and the Greens get the last one. And so now when you consider the local MPs, the top-up MPs, all as a group, you have six conservatives, six liberals, two NDP, one green, just like the proportion, which is proportional to the actual votes. So that's the quick review of mixed member. Now let's dig into the made for Canada solutions uh, or systems, and we'll start with, oh, sorry. We'll start with asking what are the unique Canadian challenges um, that these systems need to focus on. To, uh, to improve over the available systems. The biggest thing, by far the biggest thing, is the huge diversity in riding sizes that we have in Canada. The smallest riding is six square kilometers. That's Toronto Centre. The largest riding is two million square kilometers, or Nunavut. If we represent Nunavut, the area of Nunavut, with this rectangle, okay, um, then here's you know, a comparative square. And you might at this point be thinking, oh, well, that's probably Toronto Center. Six square kilometers, you know, that doesn't look that much different. Yeah, it's a lot smaller than Nunavut, but it's not that much different. Well, except that's not Toronto Center. That square is represented by St. John's East. St. John's East is at the median of Canadian ridings, 352 square kilometers, and it has the distinction that half of Canadian ridings are smaller than St. John's East, 169 ridings are smaller than that black rectangle, and 168 are St. John, well, St. John's East plus 168 others are larger. Okay. So that rectangle represents the, the midpoint in our riding sizes. And in fact, I can't show you Toronto Centre because at this resolution, the, your screen probably couldn't show a dot that small. It wouldn't show up. Um, another point of comparison here is that Germany has an area relative to Nunavut about this big. 
It's uh, 350 some thousand square kilometers. Um, so we have uh, a bunch of, uh, of ridings. Five of our ridings are bigger than Germany, all of Germany. And so some would argue that, that a system that is associated with Germany, mixed member proportional, for example, given this diversity of riding sizes might need some tweaking to work in Canada. Another Canadian challenge from an electoral system design perspective is the strong bias towards MPs that are geographically nearby. This is that, uh, that local MP thing that uh, Canadians are very attached to with good reason. Um, and so the, that plays off against that huge diversity of riding sizes and that if we make the ridings larger, then we lose this geographical locality for our MPs. Um, and the, the third thing is that we've heard over and over and over again from people that they don't like the idea of a significantly enlarging parliament. They think, you know, 338 MPs, that's about enough, thank you, um, for, a Canada, for, a, for a country the size of Canada. Um, and so that restricts the available options for designing systems for Canada. So when we take a look at mixed member proportional and compare that against these Canadian challenges, um, well, mixed member proportional is not very proportional unless a third to a half of the MPs fill those top-up seats. That means that we have a couple of choices. One choice is to enlarge Parliament by 150 to 300 MPs. That's a lot of extra MPs. Um, and we think would not be welcomed by many Canadians. Okay. Another option is to enlarge ridings so that they become one and a half times to two times larger uh, and then keep the same number of MPs that we have now. And that's the route that most people who suggest mixed member proportional for Canada take. But um, I also have to say, you know, I've, uh, I've talked with people, uh, I did one presentation in a, in a, to a riding group that was in a riding that was, I think, below, uh, probably a little bit bigger than average, but well below the size of Nuna, but by huge ways, right? And they just about went ballistic and kicked me out when I suggested that their riding would get half again as large. Or I talked by telephone with somebody in the West who, uh, who, who said, you know, next week I'm going to be driving three hours in one direction to get to a, my riding association meeting, and somebody else is going to be ri driving three hours from the other direction. And you want to make my riding bigger. So, um, yeah, that runs into problems too. Okay. So, and of course, there's also middle ground, a combination of enlarging parliament and enlarging the writings uh, and coming up with some sort of a middle ground there. But that's the challenge that mixed member proportional faces in the Canadian context. But multi-member systems like STV uh, don't get off much better. For STV or a multi-member system, you want to combine at least three and preferably more than that writings into a district. That district, of course, still elects the same number of MPs, um, but it is significantly bigger than, uh, than what we have now. And you combine those huge districts and uh, they get big. Right? And not only that, there's a fear that MPs will be geographically concentrated. So, for example, here's a area from the eastern part of BC, includes Kamloops and Kelowna, are the two major population centers in a relative, you know, in a large area covering current, six current ridings. Okay? And the fear is that you might end up with having four MPs from Kelowna and two MPs from Kamloops. Uh, and that doesn't feel right to people either in a multi-member system like STV. So that's a huge challenge as well for those existing systems. So now let's turn, let's turn to rural urban proportional and take a look at how it deals with those particular Canadian challenges. When we think about the design space for, uh, for electoral systems, so far we've talked about 
multi-member systems, you know, that, that sort of say, well, instead of having all single member writings, let's have all multi-member writings, that vertical axis. Uh, and we talked about uh, mixed member, where we move from no top-up seats to many top-up seats on the bottom axis. And of course, you know, STV is, is all the way up in one uh, corner of that diagram and mixed member proportionals all the way on the other corner of that diagram. First past the post and alternative vote are, are down there and no top-up seats and all single member ridings. But notice that there's a huge part of this diagram that's empty. Okay? And if we add some, some midpoints on those axes and say, you know, well, maybe what happens if we have some top-up seats? And what happens if we have some multi-member ridings and some single-member ridings? Well, if we think of these axes not as an all or nothing, but as a continuum, then we might believe that there is a whole range of possible proportional systems that stretch from STV at one extreme to MMP at the other extreme. And it's in this middle that rural urban proportional occupies itself. It's a mix of single and multi-member ridings, and it has some top-up seats, not as many as MMP, but it doesn't need as many as, M as mixed member proportional. So how does this work in practice? So as I've strongly hinted already, it combines features of the multi-member and the mixed member. We're going to take Alberta as an example. In the 2015 election, uh, Alberta elected, I think it was 34 MPs uh, that look about like this. Uh, you'll see the concentration of MPs right smack in the center, that's Edmonton, and another concentration in the lower left, that's Calgary. But otherwise, it's pretty sparse. So step one for rural urban proportional is to look at those densely populated areas. Edmonton for sure, Calgary for sure, maybe the area in between, and combine them into multi-member ridings. Those multi-member districts, multi-member ridings, would elect their MPs using any of the uh, multi-member systems that we looked at earlier, an open list, closed list, single transferable vote, or even local proportional representation. But the point is that where the ridings are small, and there's lots of people, we can have multi-member ridings and, uh, and gain a substantial amount of proportionality that way. More than, 50, more than half of Canadians live in those kinds of concentrated areas, well more than half, live in those kinds of concentrated areas that can benefit from, uh, from multi-member ridings without getting things out of hand size-wise. So step two, then, is to add some top-up seats, like mixed member proportional. And that's showing with the reddish, pinkish uh, diagram over there on the right. In this case, we have two regions, a northern region in Alberta and a southern Alberta region, each with three top-up MPs. And like with mixed member proportional, those top-up MPs are chosen to, uh, to make the overall system proportional, to make the overall selection of, M of MPs proportional to the actual votes. So in the 2015 election, with a, a simulation of rural urban proportional, uh, we would have had more conservatives elected in those local ridings uh, than would be proportional. And so we balance that out by having top-ups uh, seats filled by liberals and NDP. So rural urban proportional has single seat ridings, where the ridings are big and uh, the people are spread out. It has multi-seat ridings, multi-member ridings, where people are clumped together in cities. And you can have multi-member ridings without things getting too big. And then we have those top-up MPs, like from um, uh, mixed member proportional, to balance things out to ensure proportionality across the whole system. So in summary, you know, it's it's once you're familiar with those uh, other possibilities, it really is a very simple system to understand. It is proportional. Large writings can remain single member. Dense writings have the advantages of multi-member. Uh, sorry, I said large writings can remain single member. 
like they are now. Dense ridings can have the advantages of multi-member, and there's fewer top-up seats required because so many of the of our ridings would be multi-member. That gets us a long ways down the road towards proportionality. So we don't need nearly as many top-up uh, seats. And so that means that we can enlarge, get away with enlarging Parliament by only about 15%, say about 50 seats. Or alternatively, we can enlarge ridings by about 15%. And again, we think that's fairly manageable. Yeah. Um, so that's how it deals with those Canadian challenges of riding sizes. It, it just admits that you know those mixed um, multi-member systems don't work well everywhere. Uh, mixed member systems don't work well everywhere, but if we combine them, we can deal with that di that uh, diversity of riding sizes, keep our MPs at least as local as they are now, and uh, maintain a sensible number of MPs. So I'd like to stop now and uh, just ask if there's questions about rural urban proportional uh, before we go on to take a look at local PR. Okay, um, so I'm looking through the questions here, and uh, somebody's saying, why are you including closed list as an option when it has low support? <laughs> oh, that's the academic in me that just wants to be complete, to say, yeah. yep, it's an option. It might not be a good option, but it's an option. <laughs> All right. I love the idea, but how do we convince politicians and people who live in rural ridings that they're not going to become second-tier citizens? as would be the rhetoric against this? Um, so what I've been hearing is that actually the folks in the rural ridings like this because they, they, they like that they have the choice of uh, not having their riding get bigger. They like the choice of still having an MP that is you know, uh, devoted to them but they still get the proportionality by those uh, top-up seats. So I'm, I'm not convinced it's a particularly harder sell for the rural folks than it is for anybody else. Uh, but you're closer to that uh, on-the-ground education effort than I am. What, what do you hear? I think, I, I mean, I think that if somebody just heard a two-sentence description of this, oh, urban gets this and rural gets this, it would be, Unfortunately, a little bit easy to think that it's somehow divisive or that somebody's getting ripped off or somebody's not getting the same thing as somebody else. Uh, in reality, all the systems are like that. In some way or another, they're all, they all expand or contract with our geography. So our, and that's not just in Canada. If you look at Sweden, Denmark, they use these kind of um, multi-member system with top-up. The district sizes are different in different places. So it's going to be tailored to our geography. That's the other side of that. You're not getting the same thing. The positive spin is it's tailored to your geography. The other thing is it's responding to what we're hearing, as Byron started out saying, responding to what we're hearing from people who live in those large rural or northern ridings. Uh, they don't always want a riding that's twice as big. They don't always want to be part of a five-member district. Maybe they do. Okay, so BC voted 58% uh, for STV in 2005, but then in 2009, it went down to 39%. And part of the problem there was that uh, the boundary maps came out. So more people began to see that the ridings were getting larger and multi-member and what that would actually look like visually. And so this has spawned over a decade of conversation among citizens and electoral reformers about how we can tailor these two really good ideas, STV and MMP, for our geography. The other thing I would say is that if, if in BC people vote for this framework, if they vote for a system that basically says it's going to be tailored, that's when a boundaries commission would go out and talk to local people and say, what do you want? <laughs> you know, it's your voice, it's your writing, it's your choice. Do you want to have a single member writing with a top up? Do you want to be a two member district? What do you want? So it's really offering um, those voters more flexibility in how the system is designed. It doesn't have to be prepackaged a certain way. 
Um, let me see here. Does rural urban retain the imbalance favoring rural voters? This seems to be the big red herring no side argument in BC. So a little bit of background on this. I'm, uh, I'm not from BC, so you know I'm, I'm not close to the ground there. But my understanding is that there is uh, either a constitutional requirement or an agreement or something that basically says that proportionally the rural areas are going to have a bit more say in matters than, than the urban areas. And that uh, is the way things are now, that proportionally uh, uh, a, a rural vote has more weight than an urban vote. And there's a commitment to keeping it that way. So I think that uh, rural urban is adaptable enough to take that into account if that's what BC wants to do. And in particular, you know, the way I've presented it here, if we assume that the legislature is enlarged by 15%, then would use exactly the same riding boundaries and uh, the rural voters would have just as many MPs as they do now and the balance between uh, the rural MPs and the urban MPs would remain exactly as it is now. So that leaves that imbalance unaffected. Um, with the exception of those uh, top-up MPs, uh, you know, the 15% the or so top-up MPs. Um, but that seems to me to be a fairly minor perturbance in that, in that uh, uh, balance, and everybody would have a voice in deciding who those top-up MPs are. And so really the difference between rural urban and what is now is um, is I think very small. The difference in weight between uh, the, the, the rural voters and the urban voters as applied only to those top up seats. So it's a very, it would be a very small difference. And if BC for whatever reasons decides that you know that's a feature of their electoral system that they don't want carried forward, well rural urban is certainly adaptable enough to, to take that into account too. Right. So for anybody that's not from BC and is totally confused of what we're talking about, BC passed legislation several years ago that basically says that, okay, so everybody knows the goal is um, approximately the same number of voters per riding. Okay, so that's representation by population. It's totally different from what we're talking about. But BC decided that um, some uh, rural and northern ridings were going to be quote unquote protected and they would be allowed to have far fewer people per MP than everybody else. So right now that's in legislation. That's not to say that that couldn't change, but it's kind of, it would be kind of hard to predict exactly how that would change with proportional representation until you got down to the exact design of the system. It doesn't need to change. Um, for example, the northern region in BC if you look at the northern region, it's eight seats. With any PR model, you could keep it that the northern region still has eight MLAs. They would just be elected differently. So that wouldn't change that balance of uh, power in terms of population up there. Um, how do we maintain a similar ballot in different riding types? So, yeah, so we have single member ridings and we have multi member ridings. The way I would do it um, would be to simply have a ranked ballot in every riding. Um, and then, you know, the, in the single member ridings with a ranked ballot, it would default to uh, uh, alternative vote kind of thing, but everybody would rank their their choices. It's just that the rural ridings, the single member ridings would have fewer names on the ballot. Um, and the multi-member writings would also have a ranked ballot uh, with more names. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's really two choices. Everybody can have a ranked ballot or everybody can have a uh, Mark 1X. So that would be first past the post single member elections in those single member writings and list PR in the cities or everybody can have a ranked ballot. So it really depends what you prefer if you like a party list system um, or if you like single transferable vote and being able to rank candidates. Um, so again, that's a design option uh, that people can choose. Um, 
can rural urban be used without computers? And someone else asked this earlier up in the questions about STV. Can you count the ballots without computers? Ah, yes, you can, but it takes longer. Um, but so, you know, there, there's a short flip answer. Um, I'll also say, you know, so my, my academic discipline is computer science. Uh, it's it's not political science in spite of the fact that I'm you know talking about electoral systems my academic discipline is computer science and the reason I got into this is that I was using computers to model to simulate uh, electoral systems so I do have opinions about computers and elections and that is that uh, uh, Computers are fine in elections, provided you've got an ironclad way to go back and recount. Yeah. Um, and we've got those ways of doing things. You know, so, so using computers uh, doesn't scare me, provided we use them in, in particular ways. And BC, my understanding is that the mun municipalities already often vote with, uh, with scanned cards. And so you know, the computers count the scans. And if need be, you go back and count those cards over again by hand. Um, so yes, we can do it without computers, but even if we do use computers, it doesn't scare me so long as we can go back and do those recounts if necessary. Right, right. it's not the same as online voting. You would have, a paper, you'd have a, a paper record trail of every single voter's preference that you can go back to. Um, so our top-up seats for all ridings or just for the dense multi-seat ridings? Um, actually, it would, if in, in, our, in our version of uh, rural urban proportional, it would be for all the ridings, it would be for the whole province. Um, but the top-up, but the, the dense multi-seat ridings, they're already fairly proportional. And so if you're going to make a distinction as you are, it would be, are the top-ups for everyone, or are the top-ups to make the single-seat riding, uh, single-seat ridings uh, proportional? But our answer is that they're for everyone. Right. So I mean, the people in the cities don't need those top-up MPs as much. If you're in a five-seat riding in downtown Vancouver, you already have five MLAs that you can go to. So the top up is nice, especially if, for instance, you voted for a smaller party that didn't get one of those local seats, then you really appreciate having that regional MLA from a different party. But the, where they're the most needed is for the minority of voters that are in the single seat ridings. And that way, every voter has a choice of MLAs. That's what this is giving you. So that you're, it's not like you're stuck with a winner take all system if you live in one of these single seat ridings, you still will have a choice as well. Um, okay, where, where do the top of seats come from in rural urban? So you have two choices. One choice is to enlarge the legislature by 15% or so. In other words, add new MPs, and you'd have, you know, if you had uh, 87 MPs, as BC does now, it might go up to 100 MPs. Uh, the other option is to, and with that option, by adding more MPs, then the existing writings could stay exactly the way they are now, except for amalgamating some into multi-seat writings. The second choice is to start mucking with the writing boundaries to make the average riding 15% larger, and then you could uh, uh, keep the same number of MPs. We think, it's our opinion, that either option are, is acceptable to people, that, that people would be okay with a slight increase in the size of ridings, or people would be okay with a slight increase in the number of MPs. It's the massive changes required by the other systems that cause the problems. Okay. Um, so they might also, this person, uh, Antoinette, might also be asking, so when she says, where did the top seats come from, she might also be saying, how are those uh, top up seats elected? Do you think you okay. could address that, Byron? Sure. So top up seats uh, would be elected like they are with, multi, uh, with mixed member proportional. You would likely have two ballots, one that says who are, who's the, the 
person or people that you want in your local as your local MPs, and the other would be and which riding sorry, and which party would you like uh, to have your vote count for in the proportionality um, that and having sort of those those two ballots like for like with multi uh, with mixed member proportional uh, is one way that it could be done. Um, in the, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, just if you don't remember the MMP ballot, do you remember you get two votes, right? So this is the same idea. You get your vote for your uh, local MLA or MLAs, and then you'll get a vote for who you want to be your regional MLA or MLAs. So, and that would be, that's one option for how you would elect those 15% top-up MPs. So the main thing to remember with the top-up MPs is they're not, with RUPR, Rural Urban PR, they're not a big part of the system. It's, with MMP, they're a huge part of the system. 40 to 50% of your MLAs are going to be regional MLAs elected as top-ups to make the results fair. With rural urban proportional, because most of the system is already proportional, you're only talking about electing a few people. If you're in a region of 20, 20 seats configured in various ways, then you're only electing two or three regional M MLAs. If you're in a region of, say, eight, like up in the north, you would elect one regional MLA. So it's not a big part of the system, no matter how we do it. Um, Okay, if you're giving more MPs to the cities and leaving rural as is, then rural people will feel more disenfranchised. Uh, but that's the, 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 you're starting out with the wrong premise. We're not giving more MPs to the cities. Um, the cities have exactly the same MPs that they had before. It's just that now they are elected in a multi-member riding rather than in uh, individual ridings. Yeah, you could look at it the other way. The, the ridings in the urban areas are getting a lot bigger, whereas uh, people in the rural areas, get to, some of them get to keep smaller ridings, which they like. So it's, again, it's uh, how do you look at costs and benefits, but it's not shifting the balance of, of power uh, whatsoever from urban to rural. It's just reconfiguring how those same number of people in that area are elected. Um, so Anne wants to know, will this shift representation from rural to urban areas? Um, no, I don't, I, I, I don't think so. You know, again, because with what we've talked about here, the, uh, the writings all stay, we're using exactly the same writings and we're just grouping some of them together in the cities. Uh, and electing a different way in the cities where they have the same number of MPs as before. Um, so I don't think there's there's a shift going on at all. Right. So if you remember back to that map of Alberta, you didn't see the MLAs uh, from the rural areas all of a sudden all moving into the cities, and you didn't see the MLAs from the cities moving into the urban areas. All that happened is that you grouped the ones in the cities together to elect them in a multi-member district. Um, Okay. Okay, so Northern Alberta uh, from Wilf. Northern Alberta gets three top up MPs. How do we know they won't all be from Edmonton? So, you know, if, if the people want to vote for the Edmonton, the folks in Edmonton, uh, they're welcome to do that. And they could get MPs, top up MPs from Edmonton. But uh, uh, I don't think that's necessarily the way people are going to vote if that's not what they want. And um, so I, I'm not sure, you know, people, people vote for what they want and, and, they're, and I think the system will give it to them. Okay. Um. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat again because somebody had the same question. When you have the top-up seats, those regional MLAs or MPs are for everybody in the region. They're not just for the urban 
people, they're not just for the rural people, they're for everybody in the region. Okay? That doesn't mean that some voters might not access them more than others, but they're there to represent everybody and they're elected by everybody. So um, just, yeah. Anita, if I can fill in on that, just Please. with one example. So let's, in the map that's on the screen, let's, let's take, for example, uh, southern Alberta. Uh, with Calgary and you know the southern area and stuff and let's suppose that the Greens did well enough to to uh, to, to earn one MP out of that uh, that's going to be in all likelihood one of those top-up MPs and that green MP needs to represent all of the people that voted for for, for her uh, whether they came from a city or, or not you know, and so those MPs, those top-up MPs, are for that whole region. Okay, okay. next. Um, so somebody here is, it's not really a question, but it's kind of a statement, and I think she, it's just saying uh, from Carolyn here, she's, kind, she's got it. She's saying, um, the regional top-up seats, do they have geographic affinity and loyalty? If so, we can tell the rural people that they are getting more than they have now, same size riding, one representative and access to a second. Exactly. <laughs> yep. exactly. So the important thing to remember is all these PR models, and that includes the other models, are regional. Okay. So if you live in northern BC, you will not have an MLA that lives in Vancouver. This is what the opponents are trying to scare people with. All the MLAs, to one degree or another, are local, and they're they're with it with the top up seats they are within the region so yes if you are a rural voter and you have a single member riding with this system you will also have a regional MLA or, or more than one regional MLA which is more representation more diverse representation than you have right now so yes you're gaining something that's the idea you're not losing something you're gaining something um, my concern is it seems to combine the complexities of STV and MMP making for a very complicated system. Won't this be a huge stumbling block in advocating for it? Yeah, that's, that's a concern. Um, absolutely. Um, I think that we've gone into more detail here than many people want to know or need to know. If I were to advocate for it, I would, I would uh, you know, with a typical voter, I would start with a ballot like I do for most systems and say, you know, if you're living in an urban area, you have a ballot that looks like this and you choose your fa you, you rank the candidates in order of your preference. And if you're in a rural area, you have a ballot that looks pretty much the same, except it doesn't have as many names and you rank the, the folks in the order of preference. And in the cities, you get five MPs and in the rural areas, you get one. Um, but yeah, it it is more complicated. Um, Anita, uh, absolutely. And I mean, for the to the person that asked, um, Rick, when I first saw this system, I thought, "Wow, now we have three layers of things. This is too complicated." And then I spent a little bit of time looking at it, and it started to make sense to me. Um, now, most voters won't spend a little bit of time looking at it to, or to the point where it makes sense to them. They'll do, they'll, but they'll figure out that it's pretty easy to check a box or rank one, two, three, and now they have a local MLA and a regional MLA. Wow. <laughs> you know, and what I, the other interesting thing is when I looked around the world, you know how most of the world uses what we think of as list PR, right? And it's supposedly the simplest system ever and all this kind of stuff. When I actually started digging into what some of these countries do, it's more complicated than this. You think Denmark uses just list PR? You should see the, the layers and the adjustment seats and the formulas and do you think the average person can sit down and give you the calculation to how to figure out the adjustment seat and where the boundary is? No. They just they know what they do, they see the outcome, they see it as fair, and they like it. So is if we had to sell this system on explaining all three layers to everybody in Canada, yeah, forget it. But I mean I think that equally applies to most of the other systems. So we need to look at not the mechanics of how it works for the public, but what are you getting? What's in it for you? 
Um, how are the results fairer? What are you keeping that you still value? I mean, those are all things that we would put out there. We wouldn't put out there a map and try to explain a, a formula. I mean, that's, that's a recipe for failure of, of any system. I think there's a good number of people in Canada who can't explain how first past the post works. That if you said to them, well, how is it that a government with 39% support gets like 60 or 70% of the seats? They couldn't explain that to you. So, I mean, I think it's the challenge with explaining any electoral system if you're going to start from mechanics first. But if you're going to start from showing people a ballot and you're going to start from values first, then that's where I think that, um, that we have a chance. Um, would this system tend to exacerbate the existing urban-rural political ideology divide? Um, I don't think it makes it worse. If anything, I think it makes it better because now those folks that are in the rural settings that don't identify with uh, you know, the, the dominant political ideology can say, uh, can, can know that they've got an MP that they can go to. Uh, and the same for the cities, you know, that uh, the cities we often think of as the liberal bastions, but, you know, in the 2015 election, there were a lot of conservative voters in Toronto that didn't get a, an MP. And now they've got, with this system, they would have somebody to go to. So I think it helps. It certainly doesn't hurt. I, th I think, I mean, I'd go farther than Byron on this. I think all the proportional systems for Canada or for BC, including rural urban proportional, massively improve this situation. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, uh, Stefan Dion, who was a big advocate of PR and of a multi-member system, something like this, um, said is, you know, you wake up after the election and you don't know which region in your country is going to be shut out of the government. So all the proportional systems fix that. So. If you live in a region right now where every single MP or MLA elected in that region is from one party and that party is not in the government, you're sitting there for four years and your region has no power because every single MP or MLA is sitting on the opposition bench. How is that giving your region a voice? So with any PR system, every region now would have MPs or MLAs in the government and in the opposition. So no more one-party sweeps. So, you know, from, with your region, you'll have people advocating for you from the opposition and people that are actually on the government benches able to help deliver stuff for your region. So it massively improves it. Right now, our system masks diversity. You know, like many of the regions in BC, when you look at them, for instance, there's regions that every single seat went liberal, but about half the people in those regions didn't vote liberal. And so it makes it look like half of BC is liberal and half of it's NDP. So it makes it look like all the rural is liberal voters and all the urban are NDP voters when it's actually close to evenly split. So this would actually help heal that divide in a way. Um, what system is most popular in other countries that use PR? Uh, most systems, most countries use a list PR system of some sort. So that would be a, a form of multi-member writing. Okay. Um, which large rural writings would receive the top-up MPs? So, yeah, I just want to re-emphasize again that those top-up MPs are for the whole province or half of the province or a third of the province. Uh, you know, they cover a whole region. And, and together in the map that we've got here, uh, all of Alberta is covered by two top-up regions. The three MPs in the northern region cover all of the north, and the three in the south cover all of the south. They're not dedicated to any particular riding. Right. Yeah. So they, rep they represent a region. You, you want to go on with local PR? There's so many questions. <laughs> there, there are, I, I would like to go on with the local PR, and uh, then we'll throw open the questions uh, for uh, briefly for local PR, and then a free for all for whichever you want. So, if you want to ask, uh, uh, are you PR or or local? Uh, either one works. So, local PR. So, it's a multi-member system. 
So again, we're going to take a bunch of existing writings, like the six that are shown here out of BC, and combine them into one district, uh, but you elect the same number of MPs in that larger area. But the difference here for local PR is that we're going to enforce that exactly one winner comes from each riding. So this solves the problem of, uh, of having a whole bunch of MPs come from you know, a population center like Kelowna or Kamloops in this example. So uh, in, we start out with each riding nominating candidates just like now. So we've got you know, a conservative, a liberal, an NDP, and a green running in each of these uh, in each of these six writings. Then we go and vote. Uh, we'd have a ballot that looks like this, and I'm afraid I ran out of time to tailor this ballot to the geographical example I'm using. It's, uh, it's an example from Kitchener, from the Waterloo region area. But the idea is still the same. You list all of the candidates that are running in, in that multi-member region. You have a row for each party. So, for example, all the conservatives are in the top row and all the greens are in the next row and, and so on. You have a column for each riding. So my riding, Kitchener Center, is, that, uh, is the third column over, headed by Kitchener Center with the people that are voting, that are running in, in this riding. And uh, as a Kitchener Center uh, voter, my riding would be highlighted uh, with you know, slightly, uh, a grayer kind of thing. So then as a voter, I would rank the candidates that I want across all of them. I'm not restricted to my writing. I'm not restricted to my party. I can rank these candidates uh, from one to as far as I want to go. And if I uh, want to keep it like it is now, well, I just put an X beside my favorite candidate and call it good. But would encourage everybody to rank at least several candidates. For voting then, sorry, not for voting, once the voting is done, for counting, um, we would start by looking at it and, and using an STV-like procedure. So candidates with the fewest votes would be temporarily set aside and their votes transferred to the next preferences. So here are all the folks that you know, didn't get that many votes, they were set aside and their, their votes transferred. Uh, we do that long enough to come up with uh, one candidate, or until one candidate gets enough votes to win. In other words, they meet quota. And here, let's imagine that it's that conservative in the upper left. Once a candidate wins, then we uh, eliminate all of the other candidates in that riding. Notice that I've used the term set aside and eliminate. Set aside means that they could potentially still win. Eliminate means that they are out of the running, they can't win at this point. So we've got a conservative that's one in the upper left-hand corner and a liberal, an NDP, and a green that are all eliminated from the, from the election. At that point, we restart again. Everybody gets back in the race, okay, except for those candidates that have been eliminated because someone else won in their riding. Those votes from those folks that have been eliminated are fairly transferred to their second preferences. So then we temporarily set aside again the candidates with the fewest votes and transfer those votes to, the, uh, to their later preferences. And once again, we stop when there's a new winner. So now let's suppose that it's the NDP right there in the middle. Okay? Once again, we eliminate the other candidates in that riding. We then restart the counting with everyone back in the game except those who have been eliminated. So, um, and those votes, again, the, from those eliminated candidates are fairly transferred to their second or third or fourth preferences. And this continues until we have elected one winner in each of those ridings. We have one winner in each riding, but it's been chosen by the district as a whole. Okay. So because it's chosen by the district as a whole, using that ranked ballot, we get the proportionality like we do with mixed member systems, sorry, multi-member systems. Um, but we've constrained things so that uh, one of those MPs is located in each riding. They're representing the district as a whole, but they're nearby to uh, folks in their riding. And more importantly, those are the candidates that were nominated by the folks in that riding. Okay? Um, 
So that's the idea for local PR. Okay? But because it's a district-wide preferential ballot, that gives it a good degree of proportionality, as good as the other systems that we've been looking at. Each riding ends up with a locally nominated MP, um, and those voters can go to their local MP Okay, or any of the others in their district. So for example, a green voter from way out there in the east could go to the green MP that is associated with the Kelowna riding, uh, or they could go to their local conservative either way. Um, that process that I described of restarting the vote uh, every after each new winner is selected really maximizes voter input. They not only have that uh, proportional, sorry, that ranked ballot where they can list their uh, candidates in order of their preference, but every time the vote starts over again, uh, they have their, their votes are redistributed to the currently remaining preferences that are, that are still in the race. Um, and yeah, that, uh, that has, uh, helps increase the proportionality of the system like to note that there's no need for redistricting. All you need to do is group the ridings into districts, um, and you know, that would take some work, but not nearly as much work as, as coming up with new districts. And the other thing is that MPs, like all of the multi-member systems, the compete, MPs compete against all the other candidates, not just against the other parties in their riding, but they're competing against even candidates in their own party for, for their seats. So the, you really do truly, I think, have the best MPs rising to the top. I mean, all that is in the context of a proportional system. Okay. Now, uh, so let's shift now to uh, Q&A about local PR. And uh, as, as you're thinking about that and typing in your questions, uh, let me just say that this system does have an Achilles heel. And that is that the winners are elected by the district as a whole, right? So all of the people in these six ridings have a hand in choosing all six of the winners. But the folks in any given riding might feel, but oh, wait a minute, the MP in our riding isn't the one that got the most votes. So for example, that green in Kelowna, there's enough votes in this region as a whole for that green, uh, to elect a green person, but this system associates that green with Kelowna and the voters in Kelowna might say, ah, oh, but their local liberal got more votes. Yeah, but if you elected the local liberal, it would no longer be proportional. So that perception is an admitted Achilles heel with, with this system. Um, so, questions? Okay, um, so just to go back a minute to RUPR, I'm gonna rural urban PR. I'm gonna try to um, finish that and then. No, take no, 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 no. We'll come, we'll come back to rural urban after okay. we've talked about local. All right, let me see if there's questions at the bottom then about local PR. Um, okay. With local PR, does the MLA have more influence within their riding? Or does every MLA in the region have equal say for each riding? I think for for uh, items that concern a specific riding. So, for example, if Kelowna wanted to put in a, a rapid transit system, for example, that would just deal with Kelowna, and their local MP, that that green MP, would be the point person for that. Um, if it's a matter of policy that affects, you know. BC in general, then all of them would be involved. Okay. Um, if everyone only votes for their favorite candidate in their riding, like first past the post, is it still proportional? Um, no, it wouldn't be. I mean, to, to get proportional, you would have to have uh, the many people uh, voting using a ranked ballot. Okay. Um, is there no top-up with local PR? No, there is not. Okay. So it's simpler in that respect. Um, um, Anita, the prior question, can you read that one again? I think I answered it incorrectly. Uh, the one about influence, you mean? 
No, Sorry. no top about, up. About, about proportionality. If everybody oh, yeah. was it, if everybody if votes every, if everybody uses it as a first past the post ballot and just marks one X by one person who lives in their riding, if everybody totally rejected the entire concept of PR and just used this like a first past the post ballot, then I think you'd get first past the post results. Yeah. I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. But, but the chances of people doing that are kind of small because a lot of people don't feel represented in their local riding and they'll vote across the ballot. Yep. Um, okay, give me a sec because I'm kind of skimming around here for LPR specific questions. Okay, this is a comment. It seems to me the LPR ballot would need a fair bit of explanation. Some people might rank one to five within each column, not understanding that they can only write each digit once anywhere on the ballot. Um, yeah, but I, I think they would catch on. I think people would catch on pretty quick. And, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I don't see, I don't know, Byron, I don't see anything else specific. Oh, here we go. There's a new one um, for LPR. Okay, local PR seems to preserve the local member. Can't see math to show how we get proportionality. Uh, if plurality vote for party one in each riding, won't party one win all the ridings? Um, ex except that um, the voting happens for the district as a whole, right. so uh, people can vote across ridings, um, and you know for for who out of that entire slate they think represents is makes the best representative, and you've got that uh, single transferable vote thing happening, you know, so that the uh, you know, a, a green voter, for example, a, a green candidate, for example, might drop off the ballot first with the fewest number of votes, but then all those votes transfer to another, possibly quite likely, to another green candidate. And so now that green candidate with even more votes is less likely to drop off and, and work their way up to possibly, eventually, hopefully getting a seat. Um, so, no, this, this system uh, I think still does uh, get proportionality. Okay. It's How many candidates would voters rank with local PR? Can you give an example? Um, so areas, countries that, that use single transferable vote find that most folks give, you know, four, maybe five uh, uh, rankings. And that is sufficient to get a good degree of proportionality. Okay. Um, why does the ballot gray in one riding? Does that not encourage people to vote locally rather than across ridings? Good question. Um, and you know that's that's a feature of the system that is completely unimportant. And maybe we want to reconsider that. Um, I think it was put in originally to sort of give people reassurance that if they want to vote, you know, strictly locally for the folks in their riding, here's the the, the way to do that. Um, but in fact, we would like to encourage them to vote broader than that. So maybe that's a feature that should go. Is it fair to say that local PR is easiest to ridicule by opponents to PR? Hmm. Um, easiest to ridicule. I don't know. I think that depends on the creativity of the ridiculer and, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, can we rephrase it another way? Uh, uh, does local PR have more obvious Achilles heels? You know, or more obvious points to uh, uh, to object to, and I think the the one that I ident that I identified is is a possibility, um, but there's others. You know, with multiple kinds of MPs, or the writings are huge, or uh, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to attack these systems. I think it's kind of hard 
to anticipate each PR system accomplishes certain things that are really important and oftentimes it's accomplishing the same things such as keeping local representation, delivering proportional results, giving voters a direct say over who's selected and each system has what you would call an Achilles heel uh, which is the thing where we can predict that the opponents will zoom in, create a one-liner out of that and go nuts with it. And I can say that for every proportional system. So I couldn't confidently say that LPR would be the one that would be the most um, ridiculed unless we have a, a crystal ball and can see what the opponents are going to do. Um, okay, LPR would force parties to run a candidate in each riding of a district, even if they know they only have 20% support overall. Isn't this inefficient and quite onerous burned burden on small parties? So it's, I mean, it's the same situation that they have now. They would be running the same number of candidates as now. Um, if they were confident that, uh, you know, if, to, to take an example, if the, green, uh, if the Green Party in one riding was confident that their Green supporters would vote for a Green candidate from another riding, um, they might choose not to run one in, in a local riding. Uh, but they would have to be confident that their uh, that their supporters would vote across ridings. Um, okay, so let's see. There's just like so many questions, that it's hard. <laughs> and so many of them are like getting into a really narrow little thing that I'm trying to find the. Okay, there was one earlier here. So, Byron, are you still only on local PR? Oh, okay. What would happen with local PR for a party like the Bloc, which is only in one province? What would happen? So, um, so they would continue to to. I don't. I don't see that it really affects things much with local PR. The bloc would run candidates in Quebec like they do now, and uh, all of the regions, the multi-member regions, would be within the same province. So there would be some ridings in Quebec where you know a, a bloc MP is elected, and and outside of Quebec where they aren't running, they wouldn't. Um, Okay. So yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't affect things. It's the same with all PR systems, really. That question applies to all of them. Um, for local PR, have you considered introducing some sort of riding level threshold so that all candidates who do not, do not have enough local support would get eliminated? This would prevent a riding's least popular candidate from being elected. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, think about that. Okay. Um, Okay, and somebody's asking if Byron's run simulations. Yes, and when I send out the thanks for joining us, I'll send out the link to his website again where there's more simulations than you'll, you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple versions of MMP, LPR, STV, Rural Urban PR, you, you want it, it's there and you can see it. Not for BC specifically, but for Canada. Um, okay. Can I go back to a few of the ones about RUPR? Yeah, Anita, I, bef yeah. yes, certainly. I do, I do want to say one thing about the simulations, though. Um, I actually put the simulations up on two different websites, and one of them is the stuff that I did before testifying to the uh, Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform, and I, I've been keeping that one the way it was at that point. Local PR is a more recent innovation, and so it's appearing on a second website. So you'll need to send out two links, Anita. No problem. I'll send out the link to the LPR website as well. Yep. Um, okay, in my area, Interior BC, this, so this is for rural urban PR. Um, I think it would be, I would be in a field of single member ridings. So no one wants to, since no one even wants to double the size of ridings. So if all the ridings in my area vote about 51% Liberal, but 30% vote NDP and 19% vote Green, I gather we would need a heck of a lot of top-up seats, and they would likely not be from our area, right? So 
we need top-up seats, yes, to correct for those kinds of distortions. But uh, because the the cities containing the majority of the population are already relatively proportional, we don't need as many top-up seats, and uh, and those top-up seats would go to the underrepresented parties. You know, like in in uh, you know, the Greens or, or whoever the underrepresented party is. Anita, does that answer the question? I sort of lost my train of thought halfway through the question. Yeah, I, I know I know what she's saying. I mean, I think I kind of answered it before. Um, there's no 100% reassuring answer here, <laughs> as with any of the systems, right? Okay, so if you happen to live in a region that is mostly rural and interior, and BC picks rural urban proportional, whatever it happens to be called down the road. Um, and then the Boundaries Commission goes out and talks to all the people in your region. And for some reason that I can't totally get my head around, every single person they talk to says, we want all single member ridings. We don't even want any double member ridings. We don't want any multis. We want all single member ridings. Um, then yeah. <laughs> Then that yeah that call, that starts to cause a little bit of a problem because rural urban wasn't built to have a lot of top up seats you know it was built to have a combination of small multi member ridings and single member ridings and a few top ups so if everybody's going to insist on keeping all single member ridings and they all want them all the same size well guess what I have a system for you it's called first past the post so <laughs> I, I think there's going to be a need to be some flexibility and compromise. Um, within regions and I'm not totally convinced uh, that there will have to that one region is going to want all singles I guess that would be my answer Byron mm -hmm. yeah I mean would would want to make the regions large enough to include uh, some all, all regions should include a mix of multi-member and single member writings and that's that's just one of the design constraints for rural urban right to make it so so with rural urban you might be within a larger region so if your region has uh, 20 seats within that region okay so if you imagine a big circle I, I'm not for the person that asked I think she's kind of got it but for some other people if you imagine a big circle of your region and within it you have multis and you have singles and you have top-ups. If you're within a big region, you'll have two or three regional MLAs. So you'll still have a choice. Would they be farther away? Don't know. It's kind of hard to predict at this point where the regional MLAs within the region would actually live. I mean, that's going to be largely up to the voters. But where they live is sort of beside the point. They would go to, presumably go to different areas to hold that have offices in different areas in the region and circulate between those offices. Right. Independent of I where mean, they actually live. And if we look at what MPs and MLAs do now when they have a large rural area to cover, that's what they do. They have branch offices. I mean, the other way to look at it is if you have, say you have, um, I don't know, an NDP regional MLA in a big region, okay? And in the city, in that region, there's already two or three NDP MLAs. That regional NDP MLA is not going to be driving down to the city to buddy up with the other three NDP MLAs and represent those people. I mean, he does, but why would he? There's already enough NDPs there. He would be spending more of his time representing the parts of the region that don't have that representation. So it'll where they put their branch offices and where they go to is going to be affected by voter need. They're, so I don't think they're all going to necessarily um, clump themselves together in terms of where they're providing service. If you live in a conservative or liberal riding, um, the NDP regional MLA is going to want to make sure that you know that they're there and that they serve you. I, I don't know if that sort of answers the question. Um, okay, bear with me because there's so many questions. Oops. Okay. So 
somebody's just uh, talking about how the liberals in BC are against PR. Um, correct. Who I may have missed it, but does anyone else use this system? Uh, no. Both rural urban and as well as uh, local PR are uh, made for Canada solutions. Although uh, Sweden does have a system that is very, very much like rural urban, um, in that uh, they have a mix of, of local and and uh, multi-seat ridings as well as some top-ups. So it's very similar, but I, um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, so I misspoke earlier. So yeah, Sweden uses a form of rural urban, but uh, local PR is, is uh, uh, doesn't have any uses anywhere yet. Um, you know, I would say for rural urban, until recently I thought it was just Sweden, uh, but so far now I've found three countries that you have this exact same idea of multi-member ridings of different sizes and what they call adjustment seats. So if at the end of the day um, the results aren't proportional, they have these adjustment seats. And so it's Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. Um, and Malta also has something a little bit different but similar. It's adjustment seats as needed. So this isn't a unique idea invented by Canada. It's actually pretty common to have this small layer of top-ups to kind of even everything out and make sure that the overall result is proportional and be able to adjust the size of the district. What makes it unique in Canada is that we would be keeping single member ridings. Most, some singles. Most countries don't, um, that have they don't have the, if they, unless they use first fast to post or MMP, they don't have a need for single member ridings. It's various sizes of multi-member. Um, in terms of LPR not being used anywhere in the world, correct, it's not, but LPR is just STV. It's STV with a different counting method. So if you look at all the places that use STV, they don't all use the exact same counting method. So in a sense, no, nobody uses this exact method, but many countries use the same concept. <laughs> Anita, I see a number of questions asking about Go the distinction it. between, under local PR, between setting aside and eliminating. Um, the difference is, when, when I said that a uh, candidate was eliminated, that means that there's no possibility that they will win in the election. They're taken out of the election um, and their votes are transferred to other candidates. Um, when they're set aside, it means that they won't win in that round. Remember that the election started over a number of times. Uh, when they're set aside, it means that they can't win in that round, but they, there's a possibility that they could win in a subsequent round uh, after they're uh, resurrected, so to speak at the beginning of the next round. Um, can you picture a district campaign under RUPR? Um, so what does a district campaign look like under RUPR? Um, so in a single member riding, I don't think it looks any different than it does now. In a multi-member riding, um, you would probably have the party members campaigning to some extent together, uh, but also wanting to distinguish themselves from each other without trashing their colleagues, because they you know want to make sure that votes transfer. Um, so they would be there would be a sort of a mix of of campaigning together uh, to to some extent at least in pro promotional materials and flyers and things like that I would think. Um, and perhaps in you know, town hall meetings and things like that, as well as you know, they'd be in doing door knocking and on the ground work independently as well. Anita, as you look at STV happening in other countries, how do you see people campaigning? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think we're going to have somebody in January on our next webinar. Uh, who lives on the Australian Capital Territory where they use STV and is quite involved in politics and has worked for ministers in the government and he's uh, quite a friendly personable fellow and he's going to explain to us how that kind of campaigning and system works and how voters like it. Um, so stay tuned in January. In terms of uh, what I've looked at, 
the research in Ireland, how they campaign, it's the parties manage it. Um, they manage it so that um, the candidates are motivated to tell the voters, vote. For, say there's three liberal candidates running in a five-member riding. Vote for me first, okay, because you like me, right? I'm, I'm your local guy. Uh, and vote for my uh, colleague in the Liberal Party second, and vote for my other colleague in the Liberal Party after that, right? And that's how they try to keep voters to voting within the party and keep the party votes together, right? Um, so, and the parties will, you know, people are worried that all the candidates will come from the same city and all this kind of stuff. But the parties manage that. They, sorry, a little, uh, there's uh, some kids here. Um, the parties, uh, run one candidate from one part of the riding and their other candidate from the other part of the riding. So there's a very strong local connection. So if there's two liberals running in your five member district, you might know one of them very well because they live near you and you might not know the other one very well because they live in the other rural part of the riding and it'll be more voters there that vote for that person. So those are different ways that they uh, increase cooperation and also um, you know, com compete without getting in each other's hair, so to speak. Um, okay, so somebody is asking about First Nations. Uh, okay, so how do, how do we deal with, the, somebody's saying none of these systems are good enough for First Nations, that they need to have their own parallel election or their own seats. Sorry, what was that again, Anita? First Nations. So people are saying that, you know, all of these systems don't really adequately represent First Nations and could they not have their own First Nations seats? Could, could there not be a parallel election on the reserves um, to make sure that we increase the representation of Indigenous peoples? Yep. yep. So that's another whole uh, dimension to, to this thing that it would be good to look at and would be good to have First Nations advocating for and, and others, of course, advocating on behalf of First Nations in, uh, in New Zealand. They have specific seats set aside for the Maori, um, you know, indigenous peoples uh, that only Maori can run in and uh, I believe only Maori can, can, can vote for. Um, maybe we need to do something like that here too. I see that to some degree, a sort of orthogonal, um, you know, fancy word for for a separate but related issue that sort of cross cuts this. Um, you know, I can imagine that we could set aside seats for First Nations people under any of these proportional systems. Um, so that's why I say it's orthogonal. It's sort of, uh, you know, obviously very related, but it doesn't, I think, have a strong influence on which specific system we choose, that most of the solutions are going to require some other parallel kind of solution that goes along with it. Okay. Um, somebody else is asking about LPR. Do you have to know something about 24 different candidates? Um, so lots of these uh, uh, proportional systems have more candidates running. Uh, that you need to get up to speed on. Um, and I think people are pretty good at sort of winnowing out the folks that they're not, that they're not going to consider and narrowing in on, on the folks that they do. Um, and people do it in lots of other places in the world, so I think it can work here too. Um, but yeah, there are more people, uh, more candidates for them to narrow in on. I yeah, I want to say this is the same with any system. I mean, today's webinar, we're focusing on rural urban PR um, and local PR, which is a, a variant of STV um, for our needs. But even in an MMP system, if you see the regional party list, you could be looking at 12 to 14 names under each party. Does that mean that you need to know about 48 different people? Now, me, I'm going to just name one party that I can't stand. Let's call them Party A. I don't care who's on their list. I'm not going to vote for any of them, so it makes absolutely no difference to me. So it's the same thing with an LPR ballot or, you know, a single transferable vote ba ballot. You're going to see these names, but you don't really care about all the candidates. You care about the parties that you're interested in and the candidates that you're interested in. And, you know, out of the 
last election in Ireland, they showed that people ranked an average of four. So it's, there's no expectation of people ranking all of them. If you only want to mark one, you only have to mark one. If you want to get out your uh, catalog and figure out how to rank all 20 of them, go for it. There are people that will do that, right? But as long as you're hit, we're hitting some kind of a middle ground there where people are at least ranking a few, we're going to get proportional results. Um, Anita, I noticed someone, someone else stated that my mind boggles as I try to think of an all-candidates meeting for which, which happens a lot in southwestern Ontario. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, an all-candidates meeting with 24 candidates would be um, pretty unmanageable. My, my, my guess is that what would happen is that would end up with more all-party meetings where you'd have a representative from each party to uh, talk on behalf of all the candidates for that party. I think also that Elections Canada could do a much better job of making it easy for us to research these candidates. You know, if they would simply have a, uh, a blog or a website, you know, where each candidate may put up a, uh, you know, their information, perhaps in a structured form to, uh, you know, to, to make researching these these uh, candidates easier. So you'd have one place to go to and you could find the candidate statements on a variety of issues that that would go a long ways towards, towards solving this problem as well. Right. And I think we also have to remember, you know, with the uh, regional candidates, they are almost certainly like going to be the same people that are also running in a local riding. So some of the voters already know this person. It's not like somebody that's kind of out and far left that the party puts in. They're going to be the same people that are running locally. So they'll have some recognition, at least in some area. Um, so somebody wants to know, this is a good, maybe interesting question to end on here since it's after 3.30. Regardless of type of electoral reform put forward, it has to be, um, okay, simple. It has simple to understand, empowering for people to say yes. Um, okay, which method would be the best to sell in your opinion? So <laughs> everybody's asking the same question. You know, the question is phrased in different ways. It's like, these are really neat options for Canada because they're tailored for us, but because they're more complex than first past the post, uh, how do we sell these things? So I, I, think, I think the key for selling it is something that Anita alluded to earlier, and that is we can't get mired in the stuff that we've been talking about today. We, don't get, we can't get mired in the mechanics of how it works. We needed to, to sell it as what does this do for Canada? You know, what, what's, what's in it for the voter? What does it do for Canada? How does it change our, pol our politics? Uh, what are the benefits? And need to stay pretty high level about how the mechanics work. I think, you know, starting with a ballot is a great way to do there, to see, you know, the ballot is, uh, is not a, a big issue that some people imagine it to be. Right, and when I send out the thanks for attending the webinar, the last couple times I've been sending out sample ballots. Um, so I'm going to do that again so everybody can see that. And in terms of, you know, British Columbia, for example, because that's our up and coming opportunity, um, for all the systems that are going to be on the ballots, most people are not going to get into the weeds. This is an in-depth learn about webinar for the niche of people who really want to really want to know, okay? What I want to be able to say to everybody is that all the systems give you strong regional representation, that all the systems keep local MLAs, that all the systems deliver proportional results, and that all the systems can be tailored for our geography. And if I can say that about all the systems, which I can, then we can focus on that higher level thing and the people that want to dig in and, you know, are really into that how it's configured thing can that information will be available but we're not going to be leading with mechanics or we're lost you know for any system um, and so if I'm final pitch is if you're in BC the government has put out a consultation it's an online survey Fair Vote Canada BC has developed a guide for the survey to help you navigate some of the more difficult questions on the survey. So I'm going to send out a link to that as well for people that attended the webinar.
Okay, so thanks everybody for your time. Um, this entire three-part series is going to be on YouTube on our channel, YouTube dash YouTube slash Fairvote Canada, and we really, really appreciate uh, your time today in joining us. And feel free to email us any other questions that you have. Anita, one more thing. Byron, and that is that several people asked about availability of the slide deck. Uh, I will put them on the web, and Anita will send out the link to them along with that uh, thank you for attending email. All right. Thanks, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for attending.